grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. Today we'll be looking at the topic, the eternality of God, the eternality of God. That is the uh, the unbeginning, <laughs> the God that has no beginning, and the unendingness of God. If there's any word like that, God is the only one without beginning and the one without end. We are looking at the eternality of God, or the eternity of God in some cultures as it's called. Basically, it's the aseity of God with respect to time. That is, God has no, there was never a time God did not exist. I think that should give us a pause right there, that God will never cease to exist. There was never a time God did not exist. There was a time I didn't exist. There was a time you didn't exist. There was a time everything all around us never existed. And there was a time it all came into being. But there is one, the eternal one himself, the ancient of days, that there was never a time he did not exist. He is the one that has no beginning, but that began the beginning. So God will never cease to exist. This is great comfort to us as his children. This is great comfort to us, the redeemed of the Lord. That there will never be a day God is not existing. And we've had leaders in the past before, and maybe presently, depending on where you are living at, where we just they, they were sold out to the cause of humanity. People appreciated them for what they did for their nation, for what they did for the company they were working at, and they could wish that they would be there forever. But circumstances of life, life gets the better of people. They come a time whereby no longer maybe due to age or I mean due to other circumstances they couldn't get to be in that same leadership position or in that air or even in a, in a, in a soccer team in a, in, a, in a sports team where you have a star player and you could almost wish he's playing forever but the time we come this thing we go down none can be said like that of God it will never cease to exist that is there will never be a tomorrow that God is not already there and that is great comfort to us because we know that it's not only existing for existence sake, but it's also existing for our good. It's existing as our helper, our refuge. There will never be a place where God is not existing. So it's not just time-wise, but even space-wise as well. What a joy. God's existence is not contingent upon anything. Everything that is living, their existence is contingent upon something. So I'm living today, you're living today. Our existence is contingent upon us breathing in oxygen from the plant kingdom. So every creature's existence is dependent on another creature. God has designed it in his wisdom that way. So that, <laughs> I mean, we don't get high-minded of ourselves. The lion can't pray that it was going to live by itself. It's going to die in itself because it has to feed on other animals. And of course, the, and the waste of one animal is like maybe a fertilizer to the plant. So, there will, But God is the only one that whose existence is not contingent upon another creature. He is all by himself, self-existent. It's called in the attributes of God, the aseity of God, A-S-I-T-Y, the aseity of God, the self-existent of God. So God's existence is not contingent upon anything, upon anyone. If he desires that we give him praise, whether we praise him or we don't praise him, it adds nothing to his perfection. It's actually essentially for our good. So God is self-sufficient, self-independent, is independent of anything outside of himself. All he needs is he is in himself. So God that say it essentially means that he's independent of anything outside himself. So that he created was the good pleasure of his heart, was the kind heartedness of him to display the manifold wisdom and his glory to his creation. So creation was not because God was lacking in something, God was insufficient, so he needed something to complete him. No, creation is absolutely the sovereign act of God's goodness towards mankind. God's eternity is the aseity in respect of time. So if we look at it this way, the correlation between the God's aseity and God's eternality, the aseity is that essentially God depends on nothing to stay alive. You and I cannot say that. We need oxygen to breathe. We can't say we don't depend on any. We need food to eat. But in terms of eternality of God is in respect of the time. That God is not living in time. God lives beyond time. Time is dwelling in God. So with respect of time, we now say the eternality of God. The God without beginning and the God without an end. God's eternality means that He has no beginning nor ending. The Alpha and the Omega, the originator of all things, he began the beginning. He did not begin in the beginning, but he began before the beginning. So, in looking at this, it just helps us to bow in adoration and in appreciation of this God. Because a contemplation, as it has been often said, that look, that the highest thought the mind can contemplate on is on the thought of God. There is no food 
or no meditative material for the heart like God himself. The more our heart is being magnified, our heart magnifies the majesty of God. We just find out that, I mean, there is peace. I mean, there is an aura of his presence all around us. At no point did God not exist. I cannot say this of myself. There was a point I didn't exist. There was a point you did not exist <laughs> because you are not ashamed of this. And there will be a point you no longer exist. I mean, physically speaking. Although for man, the soul doesn't really die. The soul is either going to be with God in eternity, New Jerusalem, or in the damnation of fire. But I pray by the mercy of God as his children, our Lord is with God in the, in the New Jerusalem. But there was a time we did not exist. There was a time you and I, but none can be said like that of God. There is actually no place God is not existing. So when we are looking at the eternality of God, we might have tendency to say that it is, it is, it's in the scope of time-wise. But we can also embroil in it because whatever God is, is infinitely that. So there is no place God is not existing. There is no time God did not exist. And there will never be a time God is not existing. What a joy. God did not begin in the beginning. He began the beginning. So, as it's often said in Genesis 1, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So, it said that it should be Genesis 1, verse 0, as uh, the late mouse moral, blessed memory, that before the beginning God, then that's Genesis 1, verse 0, then Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created. So, let's not think that God began in the beginning. God began before the beginning. He, he didn't even begin. He's without beginning. He began the beginning. So, there's never a time that He, he had not been. He had always been. Time was created by God in Genesis 1, times and season, the greater light will rule by the day. So God lives in an everlasting now. He has no past nor future. Very mysterious. It's one of those things whereby we could call the Godwood of God. God dwelling eternally as now is never changing. You and I will age. You and I, one way or the other, there was a time we were kids, babies. Growing up, our body went through changes, but God is the immutable one that doesn't change. So He lives in an everlasting now. So even what it's going to be tomorrow, God has already lived our tomorrow today. Or even now, I want it today, yesterday, and uh, in the future. I mean, this essentially is just talking about time-wise for creatures. God is beyond such. God is beyond those kind of a thing. When we are talking of time-wise, yesterday, today, yes, God uses those times in the Bible because that's the language we understand. It doesn't mean that He Himself dwells in time. It's beyond that. It transcends time. Time in scriptures refers to our time, not to His. So time is scripture. I mean, we have dispensations, we have ages, we have uh, periods in human history. And all these ages and periods, God is beyond such. It's regarding to us. He created it. He said, I mean, the earth goes around the sun, 365 days uh, on, for the most part in a year. God is beyond that. God created the sun. God created the earth that was going on. He created the whole universe. So God is beyond that. So when God is speaking in time in scriptures, it is actually regarding our time. And so a thousand days could be, a thousand years could be a day, a thousand day years could be one day, a thousand days could be one year. I mean, it's just the sovereignty of God. God is beyond that. So when we are looking at the eternality of God, especially when God speaks, God always speaks in the now. God speaks into things that have already caused those things that are not as if they were already because He dwells in eternity. God dwells in eternity, but time dwells in God. So time is in the confines of God. That's why He could maybe move Joshua to tell the soul to stand still because time is dwelling in God. And as someone said, it's probably why we have one less day in the month of February or the, the month of February is um, just 28 or 29 days for some part. But essentially, God dwells in eternity and He calls us, especially one of the calling of the new creation is to call us out of the ruins of this world, out of the time we are dwelling. I don't mean physically, that's why we are seated with Him in heavenly places, that our God's thoughts become our thoughts. And because He called us before it's in eternity past, in, Gen in Ephesians chapter 1, He predestined us before the creation of the world. So God wants to call us our mentality to not just be things that are confined with time. So God has already lived all our tomorrows just as He has already lived our yesterdays. So that's why there's nothing new under the sun in the eyes of God. Whatever we think, inventions or um, things around us, types of phones, uh, technological advancement and what have you, God has already lived it. There are things that we have not even seen and that's why we as children of God, we are in that posture of praying to God and opening our hearts for the wisdom of God to give us witty inventions because 
God knows the kind of things that can be created or that can be battered on this earth that will add value to humanity. And we want to be the instrument through which those come to the earth so that all glory will be to God and His light will be shining forth through us. <coughs> Excuse me. Time began in God and we end in Him. So time originated in God. Genesis 1, right? Um, you made the greater light to rule by the day and the lesser light by night. There are times and seasons. As long as the earth remains, seas, time and harvest shall not cease. So there's time, there's the winter time, there's the uh, spring, there's uh, summer, there's fall. There are different times in life and God created it. It doesn't mean that God dwells in that hall. It doesn't mean that God is confined to walk in the space of that. He lives beyond that. Man is for Sabbath. Sabbath is for man, not man for Sabbath. God is beyond the times and seasons that we in. So time actually began in God and we ultimately end in God. Of course, and in the eternity future in the new Jerusalem where the sun will no longer be the light. But God himself, the light of the earth, great city. Hallelujah for that period. Revelations 22, you can read more about. God is not compelled to wait for the hour and to move. For him, everything that we happen has already happened. And it doesn't mean that we are oblivious of the times. I'm not saying that we throw away our wristwatches and uh, stop looking at time. No, God still works with time to carry out His purpose. But let's not bring God to our level. God is beyond what we think. So let's not think God is waiting for the hour hand to move on this. God, in the eyes of God, God has for, for Him everything that will happen has already happened. This is why I say, let the weak say they are strong. Let the poor say they are rich, and that's why we as well let the sick say they are strong because God has already seen the air. That's why He calls us to rejoice before Him. He calls those things which are not as if they were. And you can see how God is living there. Look, I've already seen the end of this, and He encourages us in faith to speak out what He speaks as well. <coughs> Isaiah 46 10. This is why God can say, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. That I am God, as Isaiah 46, God says that God boasts and pride himself. We see a lot of that in the book of Isaiah. That look, I am God, there is none like me. I I am beside me, there is no God beside me. So he declares the end from the beginning. Because anytime he's declaring or making a declaration, he has factored in he has seen every future contingencies. And because he has the power and the wisdom to bring his desires to pass, he can declare it that this is this will be and it will stand i'm the one that speaks as the lord to say that who is it that says the thing and it come to pass when the lord has not commanded it i think that's isaiah 8 9. so we see that part all through that god calls those things which are which are not as if they were because it dwells in eternity he sees the end and the beginning in one view so <coughs> i almost want to excuse me again i only want to use the illustration of a movie producer but god is more than movie producer the movie producer is not He's not really moved in the suspense move when the movie is going on because he knows the end already. And so as I think was Shakespeare that said it in his book, uh, As You Like It, that this whole world is like an arena, like it's almost like a drama. <laughs> and God has appointed everyone, their entrance and their exit and their entrances. So God sees the end and the beginning in one view. So even, and this is not just for the sake of just knowing about God abstractly, no. For our day-to-day -day living, as a father, as a mother, as a child, in any walk of life you are in, God knows the end, the beginning and the end of that situation. So this is why this is pushes this pushes us to the place of prayer and intercession and fellowship with Him. Because I mean, if there's someone who knows all things, and if there's someone who dwells in eternity, who is able to give it, I mean, flawless direction and leading, and then ah, wisdom demands our fellowship more with Him because they are they alone we can entrust our entire life into them there was never a time god when a time when god <coughs> was not there was never a time when god was not and there will never be a time where god is not this is a joy this is joy tomorrow god will still be on the throne his throne is unelectable nobody will succeed god ha ah, hallelujah and this is why we are always full of thanksgiving and praises to god because we are serving a god in whom all things consist, all things are held together. He upholds all things, He bears all things, He sustains all things, He created all things. And what a joy! Nothing is outside of His control. Even what the enemy thought they are doing, God could use what they are doing for the good of His children. What a joy! If anything exists, it is because someone has always existed. So the mere existence, there's no such thing, there's nothing that can exist from nothing. That is in the sense that there must be 
a cause for everything. God is the only uncaused cause. C A U S E D. God is the only uncaused cost of all things. So there is a cause, there is a there's a channel through which everything came into being. Nothing just came out of anything. It is God out of nothing created something. So everything has their source from something and they also have their sustenance from that thing that created or from that being that created them. So if anything exists, it is because someone always existed. So let's not the foolish say there's no God. The atheists know what they are saying. They know that there is God, that there's no how this perfect world will be in its place, the sun, everything in, and you think there's no God. So if for anything to exist, it's because the eternal being is existing. Nothing could absolutely be now without the existence of an eternal being. There must be there must be someone existing that is the reason for the existence of all things. Someone who is eternal, the Lord Himself, is the reason for the existence and the sustenance of all things. If he seizes his breath from any creature, that is the end of that creature. So there's no such thing like an uncaused cost of all things around us. This universe did not just jump on the universe. God is the only uncaused cost, the only uncreated being, the eternal one that is the means and the sustenance of all existence. This is why we bow in adoration before Him. We honor Him as our source, as our sustenance, and of course, as the one who is going to be glorified in and through everything that we are doing. What a joy to the greatness of God. God's eternity is essentially part of His aseity. As we said earlier on, the aseity of God is basically the independence of God from anything outside of Him. So, it's the self-existence of God, the uh, attribute of God that says that He relies on nothing outside of Him to be Himself. So, in anything He's doing, He has enough, more than enough resources in her, in house within Himself to do all His work. Nothing precedes God. Nothing was before God, and nothing, no God will succeed God. Every position in life, leadership especially, will be succeeded by somebody. Nobody is going to live eternally, even for the, the monarchs. <laughs> There's a time for their time to get out of this earth. Nobody is going to be here forever. Nobody has been here forever since creation. So, but nothing precedes God, and nothing, and no God will succeed God. And I think for our day-to-day -day living, for any projects we want to go on, for any task, endeavor, let's always remember to commit it to the hands of God. Let nothing precede God in that project. Let nothing precede God in our family. Let God be the first. Let God be the ultimate goal. God be the reason why we are embarking on any endeavor. God be the reason for any relationship that every part of our being is saturated with the eternality of God. We have eternity in view that God, will you be glorified in this? You know the end from the beginning. And this particular job, in this particular position, in this particular project, will you be glorified in it? And God is always faithful. He said we should call upon Him and He'll show us great and mighty things we know not. Everything may cease to exist. It would be impossible for God to fail to exist. Everything, <clears throat> the whole level and the earth will pass away, Revelation 21 says. So everything is going to pass away. Everything we see may cease to exist. Let's say the angels could cease. I didn't say the Bible didn't say they would cease to exist. But let's just say the angels could cease to exist. Man could cease to exist. The plants, everything, but God alone is the only one that cannot cease to exist. As the eternal being, as the source of existence of all things, God, there will never be a time that God will fail to exist. And there will never be a place God is not existing at. And God really is a, is a, is a, is a passive, God really is passive, passive, passively existing in any realm. And this is the power of prayer, whereby we are praying and eulogizing Him as the great God to manifest himself like never before. He never came into being and would never be out of being. That's the majesty of our God. Never came into being. Never like, okay, and he was not and he just all of a sudden came in. We can say of, um, I don't know much about Methuselah, but what Genesis said was like, no father, no mother. And um, um, we could say of Adam, Adam was created. But we, I mean, we look all around, but we could say God alone is the one that never came into being and never be out of being. We all came into being one way or the other. <laughs> so, for be able to, every creature, angels, everyone came into being. God created all things, visible or invisible, whether they be truth or dominion. But He Himself was never, there was never, He never came into being. He has always been in existence. 
What a glory and majesty of our God. He is a being who must exist for anything else to exist. <clears throat> for humans to exist, the plant kingdom must exist. If the whole plant kingdom should die and not produce oxygen, humanity will fizzle away. And if humanity fizzles away, the plant kingdom as well will fizzle away. But there is a being that is the reason for the existence of all creatures. That is the person of God himself. The eternality of God. The eternity of God is a being who must exist for anything else to exist. And the joy <coughs> of it, excuse me, that's why it's called the eternal God. The joy of it is like his existence is not contingent or dependent on anything outside of himself. This is why we often we, we eulogize him as the one whereby even the young lions look up to him for food. The ravens look up to him for food. His whole creation are looking up to him. He's a being whose non-existence is impossible, utterly impossible for there not to be God. I mean, someone will say, that, ah, why are we looking at the eternity of God? It's one of the attributes of God. It helps me in my praise to him. It helps me to lift my mindset about God beyond my time-limited mindset whereby I'm thinking that oh God has only uh, God doesn't there's no much time with God we can get so much done in the tinkle of an eye <laughs> the whole heavens and earth I mean creation was basically six days <laughs> it wasn't even six for full days so when we see the fact that it helps us it magnifies God in our heart it helps our adoration it lifts our faith up to that point that whatever we want to get done is not as huge as the creation of the heavens and the earth the time dwells in God, God does not dwell in time. The core concept of eternality is God's permanence. He exists everlastingly. So again, pounding it and pounding it, that the concept of God's eternality is that it's permanence. It's unchangeable. That's why I say, I am the Lord, I change it not. The immutability of God, the unchangeableness of God is always true to himself, always true to his being, his nature. So we see that that's the core concept of eternality, that when God says, I am good, that goodness is for eternity. When God said it's merciful, that mercy endures forever. So we can see this in the attributes of God, that God is patient and long-suffering. God is infinite in anything that he's doing and in his constant, not changing. He neither grows nor ages. There is no aging, there is no improvement, there is no addition to God. God will not be better than he is today. God was not better than he is yesterday, than he was yesterday. And he will not be any time. He remains the same. All that God is, he is in himself. He is in, in himself. His eternity is our greatest comfort. And this is one of the, our soul finds rest in the eternality of God. It could be uh, when, 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 when people lose their loved ones, uh, many times, especially maybe the breadwinner or something like that, it seems like if uh, the heart is uh, the heart becomes depressed because here you are this is like the key person or a key factor in this organization or in this family or in this nation that is gone and uh, there's a fear even in the world in the corporate world there's a certain insurance policy they, they have for the settlement of that or that's the key person that because they know if something happens the success or the failure of that organization is it's going to be determined right there and there and but what a joy that for god there is no cessation of existence everything is subject to cessation of existence but not with god so this is our rock as the theory put it that's why god is likened to a rock that is our rock that is a sure study steady foundation god's eternality marks the difference between the creator and the creatures and his creatures that is the difference that is the distinguishing factor the line between it's more than that there are many other lines but this one because the creatures <clears throat> there was a time we all came into being huh? so there was never a time we uh there was never a time that we were or um there was a time we were not but for god it cannot be said like that because there was never a time god was not so that marks the difference between the creator and the creatures god's eternality is his lordship over time his lordship over time so sarah at 90 could give back so and god can go beyond time to do his miraculous work god is not confined with time god is not confined though he created time but himself cannot be restricted by time 
himself cannot be boxed with time so even our that's why our destiny is in his hands that's why we are thanking him we are praising that's why we are to look unto him alone Say so they look unto him and they were lightened and they were not put to shame so our dependence continually is unto him because he's not confined by time as the creator of time he stands above it he only enters into it he only enters into it to carry out his will like in the case of the incarnation of our lord jesus christ god manifested in the flesh so he himself is not he created time but he doesn't dwell in time he dwells in eternity but he could come in time to carry out an assignment for a particular purpose like we see in the case of our lord jesus christ which was essentially for our redemption for our salvation in which we enjoy today so the majesty of our god that's why in first timothy says say, to the king eternal immortal the only wise god who alone dwells in immortality to him be glory forever and ever he transits time because he has no beginning or end so god has no beginning he has no end so because he transits time he lives beyond the realm of time you and i have a beginning every river has a beginning every country has a beginning the whole world has a, the ages have beginning every creature has beginning but god alone is the one without beginning and without an end and we bow little wonder in uh, revelations 4 the angels the 24 elders casting a crown before him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever so from him everything flows so from him the eternal god himself everything flows and through him everything functions because all things consist in him as all things are held together in him as a hope for creation and for him everything exists so everything is existing for him to bring out to display the might of his glory the manifold wisdom of god so we can see the majesty of god maybe romans 11 36 33 is what we'll have put there therefore of him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever that is it's for his glory to be seen from him everything flows through him everything functions and for him everything exists for so every part of our entire being is for the lord himself to be glorified to show forth his glory what a joy he transits time because it does not change so one other reason again is that he transits time he lives beyond time time has a tendency to change things plants change with times right there's a time whereby the leaves are green as a time that the leaves turn to brown i mean we change as well according to time as we're aging and we can't do without it i mean some is it's like a default mode we're going to change but because god transits time it does not change that's why i could say i am the lord i change it now that's why you descendants of jacob are not destroying that malachi 3 6 so we can see the unchangeability of god that god is ever the same ever fresh ever the same youthful quote and unquote using our human language a person forever and ever is equally conscious of the past the present and the future and so when god is speaking to us today i don't think there's a concept that he could use it in our bible to refer to things that like the gamana the god of your fathers who i mean took them by the way they knew not god is using it because he's speaking to us it doesn't mean that uh, god has to think back or everything is like existing right now so he equally is equally conscious of the past the present and the future that's why the book of revelation we just see the things that have not even happened god is already already projecting the world as it will be what a might of our god so if he has that holistic comprehensive knowledge of everything how much more our own life huh? so this is why we can trust in him that we, i know him who i have trusted for he is not without he's not limited or bound by the passing of time time exists in him again time is existing in god god is not limited by the passage of time god is not restricted by the movement of the clock is beyond that he can still it like he did in joshua i think chapter 10 because god is beyond it he transits time he doesn't dwell in time he dwells in eternity he's not limited or bound by the passage of time time exists in god what a joy what a joy to the eternality of god in himself the great god himself our redeemer our lord god's eternity eternity means that he is eternal that god is eternal eternal means that that which exists in god which exists by god which is which exists that is god himself so anything from god that exists that is not a creature is it we could say is eternal like for example the wisdom of god is eternal the life of god is eternal it's called eternal life so uh the the power of god is eternal no one is that power doesn't diminish or increase 
it's still ever fresh the same it doesn't need to be replenished so the, etern the eternity of god is basically god is the eternal being god is not in his essence this day what he was not before and we be or we be tomorrow what is not today so this gives us assurance it gives us the rest that we can trust our life entirely on god he asks us say my son give me your heart trust in the lord with all your might not of your own understanding for you all your ways acknowledge him it's because he dwells in eternity he sees the end from the beginning he knows the beginning from the end from every aspect he has perfect flawless information or knowledge about everything and he knows the best way or the best route for anything we want to do this is why we go before him to acknowledge him to ask him to direct our path he even said just acknowledge me he said many are the devices in a man's heart but it is the Lord that directs his step. So it's a joy, what an asset to have a God that knows all things and is willing. He has a kind heartedness. Out of the goodness of his heart, he desires to lead us continually by his spirit. What a joy. In the beginning, God. At the center, God. At the end, it's going to be God. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come. There will never be a time God is not existing. There will never be a place that God is not. God in his eternality. In the beginning, God. In the center, at the center, it is God. At the end, it's still going to be God. <laughs> what a joy to the eternal God himself, our Lord and our Savior and our Master, our Father. What a joy to the eternality of God. What a joy to the glorious thing he's doing. He is what he, uh, what he always was and he is what he always will be. God is not going to change. Huh? He's not going to change in his love for us, in his mercy for us. Some of them might ask, but there are times in the Old Testament when uh, the anger of the Lord arose against Israel or things like that. The change, that doesn't mean God changed in his essence. God doesn't have mood swings. Any change we read, or like for example, the scripture talks about uh, he repented the Lord that he made man. That is actually a change which was due to the fact that his creatures have, because of the misdoings of his creatures, so he changed in his dealings towards them. God doesn't change in his person, in his character. But his dealings with his creatures could change if the creatures have gone south, if the creatures have started doing despicable things, have started doing acts of wickedness, then they are now inviting the wrath of God. It doesn't mean that God changed in his essence. El Olam means the everlasting God, the everlasting God, the immortal, the invisible, the only wise God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the one who was. The one who is, the one who is to come. Our Redeemer, our strength, our fortress, our way maker. What a joy to just have him as our God. There is no God like Jehovah, the greatness of our God. Let me read 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 16. Who only at immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be glory, and power everlasting amen the greatness of our god the el olam the everlasting god himself what a joy so if we picture and this was uh, c.s lewis that said this that if you picture time as a straight line along which we have to travel then you have you must picture god as the whole page on which the line is drawn just think about that for a second or for i mean however long it's for the name of the lord to be glorified so time is a line we draw on the page of paper and so the whole page itself let's picture that as god so time is just moving in god god is not the one confined by time time was created by god so if you picture time as a straight line along which we have to travel then you must picture god as the whole page on which the line is drawn the infinitude of god the infiniteness of god the immensity of the vastness of God, if we're going to borrow those terms, because God is beyond what we can imagine. That's why His ways are not our ways, His thoughts are not our thoughts. It's far beyond every description God is giving to us through earthly things around us, because that's what He can use to find around to relate to us. So, time and dispensations are within God and not Him within them. This is called God's eternality. So, 
the dispensation we have the dark age i mean we have different dispensations in the history of mankind the, all of them came into being and they were they were regimes empires and what have you superpowers of the world that conquered and that were conquered and what have you but they god does not exist in them god is not confined with them but all the times and dispensations are within god so time and dispensation are within god and not him within them so this is god's eternality that is the lordship or his sovereignty over time is sovereignty over time not confined by time not limited by time in any form so from everlasting to everlasting you are god psalm 90 verse 2 psalm 90 verse 2 you are god from the beginning to the end the ancient of this psalm 90 you've been our hiding place, our dwelling place lord thou art been our dwelling place in all generation before the mountains were for were brought forth or ever had been from the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting you are god that is everlasting without a beginning and without an end so from everlasting to everlasting god is god god is god <laughs> what a joy his crown has no successor the throne O god is forever and ever let me read that from hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 the throne of god is forever he was never elected into office he will never be elected out of office but unto the son is said that throne O god is forever and ever the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of the kingdom every leadership position came into power even if it's by family rights or inheritance or by election depending on what part of the body or by appointment or what have you all of them have the expiration but god is the only one that has no successor he has no predecessor and he also has no successor he is the same person from eternity past to eternity future the king of kings and the lord of lords the majesty of the throne his throne is timeless his throne is eternal what a joy to the greatness of our god so jehovah is a title pointing to god's eternality so the title the jehovah essentially is believed to meet god's eternality it contains eternity past the present and the future and we can see this especially um, when god introduces himself we take some scriptures from revelation 1 and 4 as well so the jehovah title essentially the lord the lord means that the lord over time the lord over people lord over every form of his creation what a joy so jehovah is a title pointing to god's eternity it contains eternity past the present and the future let me read from uh, revelations chapter 1 verse 4 revelations chapter 1 verse 4 it says john to the seven churches which are in asia uh grace be unto you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before which are before his throne so from him who is so that title jehovah means who is that is the same person that subsists in himself he doesn't have a beginning he has, he has always been who was who was means that what that he came in time to die for our sins he came he manifested in the flesh that is is bearing all things now and who is to be his kingdom is coming to be forever interprets the title of jehovah from him who is who was and who is to come so the greatness of our god is that god is uh, without time god is without beginning god is without end we keep singing it we keep eulogizing and praising his name for it so let's just look at each of those ones who is god who is subsists in himself subsists me essentially is, in, is independent in himself that's the self-existence of god he is what he is in himself like he told moses that i am that i am it's not depending on anything so whatever he needs he is that to himself who was because he was before time that was he was before creation he was before time began because when we are using is and was is time related if i said i was uh, at the airport yesterday that means i've been at the airport i was talking up to a past period i will be means that maybe in the future but god is beyond time why so he is the one that was because it was before time and we is to come his kingdom has no end now to his kingdom there is no end to his kingdom what a joy that we belong to that kingdom what a joy that is our father our lord our strength our shield what the greatness of our god the resume essentially a part of the resume of god is the ancient of this who was before all time as the ancient of this the freshness of the spirit the newness of himself ever the same is he has energy or power that needs not replenishment 
he works in infinite wisdom that is beyond a wisdom that never gets outdated because he's the ancient of days himself so who was before all time began the eternality of god that is the god that has that is not bound by time that is not restricted by time the 24 elders cast their crowns before him who lives forever and ever i could take that from the uh, from revelations <coughs> revelations chapter 4 essentially revelations 4 verse and um, probably from verse 5 revelations 4 verse 10 rather verse 10 and the 24 elders fall down before let me read from verse um, 8 and the four beasts had each of them six wings about them and they were full of eyes within and the rest not day or night saying nor and they uh, and they were full of eyes within and the rest not day or and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was who was who is and who is to come and the and those and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne will live forever and ever the 24 elders fall down before him who sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before him saying thou art worthy o lord to receive glory honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created so there were all things were created for his pleasure for his good the God that dwells in eternity. Etern time is dwelling in God. So nothing precedes God. Nothing is before God. Nothing will be after God. Nothing is before God. Nothing is going to be beside God. Say beside me, there is none. So no, God has no equal. God has no um, equivalent. God has no alternative. There's no alternative to God. God is God by himself. All find their existence from this immortal eternal being the king of kings and the lord of lords we bow down our head in adoration little wonder is said in isaiah again i am the lord and there is no other beside there is no god beside me so today we've been able to look at the eternality of god we said the eternality of god is essentially that god has never ceased to exist god will never cease to exist that is the permanence of god god transcending time that is, God lives beyond the region of time, beyond the region of season. God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. There is no changing in the being of God. There is no change in His essence. There is no change in His person, in His character, in His attribute. His holiness is still the same. The ancient of days, His goodness is for all. His mercy endures forever and ever. Nothing is before Him. Nothing will be after Him everything has a beginning everything came into existence through god himself who doesn't depend on anything his existence is not contingent upon anything outside of himself he is everlasting now what he has always been and what he will be tomorrow god is now god doesn't change there's no changing in god there's no variableness or shadow of turning in him he remains ever the same ever faithful god the faithfulness that's why we could count on his faithfulness and his trustworthiness because God lives beyond the region of time. So when we are talking about time, we are talking about when time is mentioned to us, as we are from scriptures, it's regarding to us, not to God. God transits time. Time was created by God. God does not live in time. God lives in eternity. Time began with God and we end in God. What a joy to the eternality of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to God the Father. Hallelujah to God the Son. Hallelujah to God the Holy Spirit. The eternality of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.